there for a second there, Ron. Uh, hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another evening of the Dink Hour panel. I'm excited, as you should be excited too. You know, as usual, I'm Lenny, your master of moderation, discusser of dialogue, and all around weird guy that likes awesome things. And actually, ooh, Wendy Kornberg, hi there. You can come on up to it, Herb, too, if you want. If you guys want to come join up this conversation for a little bit. I got a great conversation started, but I'm going to offer to offer to our usual way of starting things. We like to do a little bit of mic check, make sure everything's coming through. So we're going to go through the the panel of green badges up here and introduce ourselves to the world and say hello to everyone um, and, and say exactly who we are and what's going on. I'll start. My name's London. Uh, you can grow future cannabis project. We are at online media platform. And as as you know, we're streaming over there. We're streaming over here. We're streaming everywhere. So follow, like, do all the jizz jazz. Check out the descriptions and, and stuff in the comments because there's a lot of amazing details. We're going to dig deep into bugs. And I got a great conversation started to get us rolling. But as we always do, we want to introduce everybody. So why don't you get us start rolling test, say hello, and then Matthew, Claude, and Johnny, and then Ron, and then we'll get right into it. Awesome. My name is Tess Edom. I work at Rogue Micro. We are a consulting company uh, helping cultivators overcome um, microbial challenges, labs get their methods validated, and just kind of working in general to occupy that nerdy microbiology space in the industry. Um, super excited to talk about bugs. A different. We always call microbes bugs, but it sounds like we're going to actually be talking about real bugs today. So super stoked about this. And I'll hand it over to Matt. Hey, everyone. My name is Matthew Gates. I'm an integrated pest management specialist. And uh, if you have any professional inquiries with regards to prevention and treatment of pests in a holistic fashion, um, then check out xenthanol.com where you can make such inquiries. You can also catch a lot of free information that I uh, produce for people on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, which I'm also commenting in the YouTube chat as well with. And you can also find me on Instagram at sync, like synchronize angel. Awesome. Why don't you introduce yourself, bud? Hi, everyone. It's exciting to be uh online again, uh, doing a show with uh, passionate people, uh, exchanging good info and having a really good time uh, spreading knowledge and information. Um, so I'm with Anatis Bioprotection. I'm a kind of the I'm a cannabis enthusiast since 1986, since I grown my first plants. I missed the unicorn cup. I wanted to go, but I'll be better next year. Uh, and always we'll talk about that later on. Uh, I'll, I'll provide my own entries. So I'm an IPM specialist at uh, Anatsis, and I um, take care of the cannabis sector at Anatsis. So uh, I'm supervisor of a team of passionate uh, cannabis uh, IPM uh, uh, people, and uh, we take care of licensed producers, uh, micro producers, home growers, medical growers. So we just focus on that plant. Other people at Anatsis take care of tomatoes and flowers we'll look at, but we focus on cannabis. So I'm really stoked to have uh, the show with everyone today. I'll let everyone uh, else introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Johnny. Um, I'm a cannabis cultivator by trade and cannabis nerd by hobby. Um, excited to be here and... Uh, not going to spend too much longer. I'll let Ron uh, introduce himself, and then we'll we'll take it away. Hi, my name is Ron Harrington. I work at Parkland Flower. Uh, I'm a consultant with Wildwood Cannabis Consultants, and I uh, am the owner of Gold Hat Seeds. And I've worked uh, frontline uh, putting the stuff to practice to actually uh, get rid of two-spotted spider mite infestations powdery mildew infestations and uh oh uh fungus gnats and thrips so uh, i've done all that firsthand and i i met claude me and claude we had dinner together at, at grow up <laughs> so i had forgotten that i known him until i seen the picture and then i go okay now it all comes together so i i know claude uh, uh 
from supper time. And so it's going to be glad uh, listening to all that's going on. I, I want to hear, hear what people got any tricks or of the trade. I want, I want to know them because uh, I have to put it to practice. You're up Damon. Perfect timing. You didn't miss out on introductions. Oh. Or maybe he's going to try and skip it anyways. You're going to say hi. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> incredible timing. It was, it was almost like he planned it a little bit. I, I'm just going to say that. Maybe me and him were on a phone call earlier today, so I, I wouldn't have called him off his own. Anyways, as usual. Hi. Oh, there we go. We got a hello. Hi, Cartman. How's it going? <laughs> Respect my authority. <laughs> we, we, we shot the ship for a little bit earlier today. But as... We've actually, those that have our fans, regular viewers, people that are tuning in, maybe for the first time, maybe even for the second time, or, or, or who knows. Maybe you're a brand new user, never seen us before, ever. Well, one cool thing that I would like to tell you about is this has actually been a multi-part series. We have gone through, like, all the steps of, of, of what to do it during the season and, and how to be pr proactive in IPM and pest management. We've actually had an amazing opportunity. This is the second time Matthew, we've had Matthew and Claude together. This is the fourth time we've had Claude here. We have an, a, our, our amazing panel of experts. I'm really excited um, to, to dig into it because I think there's going to be a lot of fun stuff to chat about. Today, we're focusing on um, the spring, on, on what's happening in the fall that's prep for next year if you're in a winter area. That's kind of going to be our general guideline and focus. Um, however, this is the Dank Hour, and as the Dank Hour always goes, we do trail off. We do enjoy the conversation because what is it about? It's about being around passionate, enthusiastic cannabis and really digging into those fun points. Like I want you all to feel like you're at, at a table with all of these immediate, amazing experts and they're talking shop just like any other day so let's get into it with without any waiting any longer and i got to tell you i'm a little disturbed um i'm a little disturbed if i if, if to start start myself off with I'm, i i got a, a message shortly before this show and it was it was shocking it was something i didn't expect to see and and i i, I probably will never be able to take it out of my image or mind immediately um, however, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to share all of that with you. Now, this beautiful image that you can see, if you are in the chat, if you're in Clubhouse, if you put, scroll down, you'll be able to do a refresh. Um, and you can click on me in the photo. If you are in StreamYard, um, you will be able to see the image pretty well right now um, where the chat section is happening. And you'll get a good reference of why. Um, I was slightly disturbed today. And 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 thank you, Jason Gideon, Jota Herb, Hota Herb of the uh, awesome variety. You can check him out on Thursday nights here on Clubhouse and on Future Cannabis Project. But he sent this uh, lovely, lovely image to me. And I thought this would be an awesome, awesome way to get us rolling for the day. Um, and just kind of ask Matthew and Claude, what the f <laughs> is happening here and 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 see where that guides us to begin Ooh, do i have to pick one or are you guys gonna volley for it you guys are so polite <laughs> i will go first you, well uh, you know uh, i can't actually i can't actually see the media so no me too uh what, what is the picture you said are you guys on YouTube? the youtube side as well Okay, I am. Okay, so if you look London, at the, the image, is it your profile picture? No, it's the, like the full image right now over the text there. And if you click my profile oh. picture, you can bring it up too. Oh, I see. It's the tomato. This is a tomato hornworm, or maybe a tobacco hornworm. I'm not totally sure. Uh, with the um, cursed wasp cocoons, right? Exactly. Well, great. Excellent. I always tell people that if they see something like this, I mean, there's obviously exits from the, you know, the pupil, like hull. So um, the cocoon, right? So, so, I mean, obviously a lot of those have already left, but whenever I, whenever people see this, I always tell them to kind of let it be because you'll get a bunch of parasitoids out of it. 
Um, and the caterpillar will die from, uh, from these injuries. Yes, usually I deal with other types of parasitoids, uh, three crogramma wasps um, against different uh, other caterpillars. Uh, we have different species that we use against different caterpillars and uh, against borers. Um, one of them we're going to use more often next year uh, because there's a, a new threat um, that's getting more and more important. It's the corn earworm. So it's really attacking cannabis. It goes for the buds. It goes from for uh, any parts of the plant. And it's striking right now in the Maritimes province in Quebec and Ontario. Uh, so uh, we uh, are planning our strategy for next year uh, to release these trico grandma wasps, either glued on cards uh, uh, in the pupa stage or um, dropped in cellulose balls that are dropped by a drone um, or um, for smaller uh, gardens, uh, you can do it manually. So there's little cellulose biodegradable balls that will be filled with uh, about 4,000 pupa of uh, Trichogramma ostrinia or Trichogramma basica or other species we want to add in. We rear uh, five different ones at Anetsis. And uh, then we send these uh, these balls every week in the field and they release these trichogramma that will go and search for the eggs of the different caterpillars or borers so in fact we take care of the problem in the egg so um uh, also we're for the western bean cutworm it's another uh, more and more uh, pressing issue um that is happening in our field so Another form of parasitis is the trichogramma wasps. It's very, very efficient. Uh, we we have to apply them. Though Most of them are egg like parasitoids, right? So, uh, sorry? Most of them are egg parasitoids, right? Or? Uh, they, are, they are, sorry, I, I, parasitoids, you said? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Most of them are parasitoids of the egg life stage, right? Not larval life stage, right? Exactly, exactly. They go for the egg larva. Uh, they they go for the eggs because they they're useless once the the eggs are hatched. Um, they cannot go for the larvae. They Do you have any, I, I'd love to hear. Not to inter, sorry to interrupt. I I'd love yeah. to hear more. Um, I I like to hear more about strategies of using those. The implementation. You probably was about to say that, but you know because I feel like. Um, I feel like the use of parasitoid wasps. In my experience, at least with a lot of clients, it can be kind of difficult um, to use them effectively. And I feel like a lot of that has to do with how they're applied. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments about that. And if it changes between species or target pests, like the budworm, for example, um, obviously has, is a little bit unique. Yes, uh, certain species, um, we cannot use trichogramma. Uh, it depends on which um once we like uh, for the borers we the, we could use brassica but it's not that efficient so ostrinia is the one to use to trichogramma ostrinia so we have to choose the right species according to the pest that you're trying to fight um, before the the delivery method was uh, the pupa were glued on a card about the, the size of a like a <clears throat> Uh, a Canadian dollar, anyways, and uh, it's uh, the they were glued on the the card, and you, we would hang the cards. We've been using them for many years in uh, sweet corn. Uh, our organic sweet corn growers will use them, but you have to make sure that the um, there be uh, one for every hundred square meter, or every two hundred square meter. If you use uh, eight thousand pupa instead of four thousand. Um, if you don't put enough, go further, you know? I mean, uh, if you don't uh, cover your your area size correctly, and then it won't be efficient. Um, you have to make sure that they haven't emerged when you receive them. Uh, usually we'll ship four week um, introductions. Uh, so we you release the first week and the three others you keep in the fridge 
until the next week when you release the second week and then the third week and then the fourth week. It goes on like that. Uh, the same will happen with the cellulose balls. The cellulose ball, we found it's an even better delivery method than the cards that we used to, uh, uh, that was the first method that we uh, employed. The, that's the drone application, correct? Exactly. And it can be done, it's done manually for the smaller gardens, like the mm -hmm. micro producers in Canada that have 200 square meters of a canopy to around 2000 square feet of canopy they're permitted to, to grow only. So these ones are doing these small plots outside or even the ones that have more plants, a thousand, six, three thousand plants. Uh, sometimes it doesn't really justify the drone application. Mm -hmm. um, we're using it with Bonesville and other like produce growers, like uh, big scale, like uh, produce growers right now. It's the first year after two years of experiments, the first commercial applications this year. So it's Very really, interesting. Uh, yeah. I love hearing about the new the new technological um, yes. changes. It's, it's uh, very curious. Um, so, so. Yes. <laughs> <It's fascinating. laughs> yes. I don't want to bogart the conversation though. Like, um, oh no, not at all. No, no, it's a free flow. I mean, I, <laughs> I always appreciate your interventions. <laughs> so we'll we'll let the rest of the them. Uh, Go on. <laughs> For now. I thought that anyone would be a creepy, fun start. And this this is what's interesting is we're we're really taking advantage and moving forward with a lot of things. And maybe maybe kind of a fun way to pose this question that would be a really relevant and important for a, a people listening in the audience, but also our experts on stage and 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 and, and myself included is regionally like you're both located in very different spaces. But you're what Claude, you're 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 primarily in Canada, and Matthew, you're you're, you're in the states. And by the way, you, you, just quick plug, I'll, I'll do it again. Is, is Matthew? I believe has one of the best. But you still do your Patreon, right? Your Patreon still available? That's correct. So like it really like a dollar, it's a dollar, right? There are higher denominations, but honestly, you know, one dollar is all you need. Yeah, there you Access go. to the discord, uh, you can get information that way. So um, up to like over a hundred people at this point. Um, and they, people will share their own experiences with dealing with various pests as well. And um, if you want to get a hold of me, ask a question that's sort of quick and easy to respond to. Um, it's honestly a lot better than using like Instagram because I get so many messages. So, you know, that's been very helpful for a lot of people, but thank you for mentioning that. So with that in mind, you both have kind of very different regional that you're, you're probably connecting with my guess is you have a lot larger of an American audience. Um, so what I would like to start with is Claude, what, uh, other than the new threat that we're seeing, uh, what are we seeing kind of nationally across the board when it comes to cannabis and pests? Are there are there problems or issues? Are th are there things that you're like, hey, you should have done this a month ago, or or that that could have protected against this? Like, what what's the situation looking like in Canada uh, when it comes to problematic new pests coming in, or, or or any issues? Are we are we dealing with the same stuff this year? I think it's a great time to follow up because right now, I guess we're in the thick of it with where we would have a lot of the the, the higher problems with pests. Still, the same uh, old problems that are still going on. Uh, powdery mildew, botrytis, uh, trips, um, different types of caterpillars. Most of them are like false alarms, I call them, because they're like opportunistic uh, caterpillars that will eat many types of plants and they're just happen to be there. And me, usually I'm so kind with certain insects, I'm usually, and they're having such a bad time across the globe that usually I will find them in the field and take them out and bring them to some other plant elsewhere, <laughs> depending on what it is. At the cord borer, I'm not that tender with them uh, because they really can like destroy your own plant and they're really targeting your cannabis plants and corn and other things like that. But um, so, uh, uh, yes, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I would just let people go on. <laughs> So the same major problems. Can I can I follow with the follow up? There is is what kind of what kind of things can we expect kind of at our latitude with the temperature change that's expected to come? You know, September, October, 
you know, depending on where you are, probably October, September 1st, if your plants aren't in, you're fucked. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, yes. In fact, the, the major problems now in Canada, uh, the emerging ones, is the aphids. Aphids everywhere, uh, from New Brunswick to BC. Um, there was even one episode in Yukon of um, usually Columbola species are very uh, useful. They're decomposers and usually people are freaked out and I received so many requests and questions about people sending me pictures about all these springtails, uh, Columbola, in their, uh, uh, they water their plants and they see them coming out of the drainage holes and like there's hundreds and it's like horrifying for them. <laughs> it's like I said to them, relax, no issue there. But in Yukon, there was uh, one of the three orders, uh, I think it's the film, and always, I, I think I have, Matthew would not have the, maybe the right Latin name for me, it's like an encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyways, these, uh, and always I'll send you pictures, uh, Matthew, it's very interesting. Uh, they really ravage these uh, automatic plants in the field, uh, all the 10,000 of them. I've never seen uh, plants been infested by this uh, springtails, you know. That's damaged. amazing. They are the young, uh, the young plants, the young cannabis plants. I think it's because they have nothing else to eat in that field. Uh, the latitude, the Yukon, is very uh, up north. The la uh, I think there's many factors coming in uh, that wh why it happened. It was, um, so we had the first case of hemp rust and mites. In Canada, I'm really saddened because it's really nasty pests, so hard to get rid of. You almost have to try to salvage your mere, your apical mere stem to try to save your genetic, because um, you know you can fight it with mineral or vegetable oil or or uh, uh, Neozilius phalasis or Andersoni or Swirsky or Californicus or we're trying right now with the new um, then it's just back around the crazy mite, but still it's unbeatable almost this little nasty pest. Uh, the brown mites is something we can deal with, uh, but the hemp and mite is something it's almost incurable, I would believe. I don't know if you have an opinion on them. Uh, I think you're dealing more with them uh, than us. Honestly, which one I've... specifically? The I've hemp eradicated rust. hemp rust oh, mites, yeah. and and uh, they're relatively easy to get rid of with uh, with some sulfur applications. Um, they, they knock them You're right out, sulfur. honestly. Okay, yeah, sulfur, yeah. Okay, interesting, yeah. I, I agree with that. About, yeah, I almost had forgotten about sulfur <laughs> because I, I tried <laughs> to to. Uh, to to uh, not phase out sulfur, but <laughs> because people are so uh, keen to use it in cannabis industry, and all the time, uh, really gives a rough time to my beneficials, and also it does the, it for sure, and to the terpenes and things like that to the plant, and because it dep deposits itself, and people burn, uh, they use sulfur burners, and they use them too much, uh, hours at night. They should just use them if they really have to use them, just like an hour. Uh, but they go on for three or four hours or, or even more sometimes. So, so I find it's too much. So that's why I haven't looked into sulfur. But yeah, thanks, guys. It's really a good, uh, I, I believe yeah, it could be a way to, to uh, really, another tool to really fight them. Yeah, it's, it's really like a last ditch result. Like resort right there like sulfur is nasty and it's hard to get off the plants and you really have to yeah i mean it'll stay on the plants even if you're spraying other things or trying to wash it off for you know like a month so you really don't obviously want to be doing it in flower and even the end of veg it's like you know it's not the best for sure but in desperate times you know it will do the trick yeah to save genetics that's what it's important uh, sometimes so. And there's something to be said about, you know, like every, for every situation, there is a tool and a task, like to know all of them is really important and to utilize them at the right point in time, because there are probably some points in time that'd be ideal to 
you saw for, you know, late, like mid veg, you know, would, would probably be a good way to build it down. Now, one question that was asked here that I'd love to jump in and feel free. We have, we are on episode four, where you have a general guideline on where we're going to pose the conversation and move it forward to tonight. But do feel free to, to jump in and throw some questions out there in chat. If you're in chat on <clears throat> future cannabis project side on the YouTube side, I'll make sure to save that. And I'll visit it the second I have back to, I got this little function called star where I can bring it back up and pull it up there so that everybody gets to enjoy the answer live. And if you want to throw it in there in chat as well, go ahead and throw questions out there. You can also raise your hand, come on up. And if you're really enjoying the conversation, you could punch that little square with the arrow up and go share on Clubhouse and write a little thing and see, get some people in here to join the conversation. I appreciate it. Like, subscribe, the jizz, jazz, and doodads and all that stuff too. Um, but one of the questions that was recently asked, what, what's your thoughts on Karanja oil? Does it mess with bees and, uh, or other beneficials? How late into flowering can you follular? Any mixed recommendations, ratios, or other additives? To be honest, I'm not very familiar with the product. Same here. I was about to do some research as we were talking. <laughs> I'm uh, more um, knowledgeable in neem oil, even if I'm I cannot use it, and I wish I could use it, especially these uh, at least the as a max the as a directin to to make our bioservice more efficient against aphids, because it would prevent them from molting, because that's the um, low point. Um, of using the bio, bovaria, any bovaria, even our competitors uh, um, on aphids because they will molt so fast. Uh, sometimes they just molt off the, the bovaria that's been uh, that breached them, that uh, got uh, uh, applied to them. Uh, so, neem oil, I, I believe uh, you, you have to know how to use it. It has a, not, you know, everything has uh, advantages and disadvantages, but I believe this would be a good. Is a good tool to uh, to use um, uh, for many reasons, and uh, but this also I would use late in flowering any oil. Anyways, uh, um, we we don't want to spray anything on the trichomes because in fact growing cannabis, you're a trichome farmer, and trichomes are so precious. And uh, of them, even the regular water spray and like can uh, could damage the trichomes. So. Uh, especially oils, I'm not too. Uh, we have BioCRS EC, which is an oil based based formula with uh, organic sunflower oil, but it's not uh, approved uh, for cannabis production outdoors um, yet. Uh, uh, we're just gonna have the wettable powder approved for outdoors uh, for for as a spray. Um, I want to do answer Brent's question. Uh, he says that he has dead house flies like literally attached to the underside of fan leaf. I've seen that happen before. No trichomes. In fact, there is trichomes. It's just they're really small. You don't see them. You need a magnifying net to see them because they're just like fan leaves. So have not, and the, your strain doesn't produce the visible like uh, really, uh, trichomes, but I'm pretty sure the, the, it must be short flies. I have a feeling they are not even from the snap. They must be short flies that are just stuck to the underside of the leaves. Uh, that's my guess. I haven't seen any picture, but I have the feeling I had. But I, uh, it, it doesn't harm the plant really. It's the larvae yeah, that will uh, that will uh, that will eat out roots and transmit disease like Fusarium and Pitium. That is the issue with the fungus snap and. Other uh, other flies like that. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really. I'm not really sure either. Um, but I have seen that happen where even the non-glandular trichomes can sort of hold on to a, a like a moribund fly or something like like a fungus gnat that's really super light-bodied or something like that. So 
that's that's the weird thing to see. I wonder. I, I always wonder, like, is there a terpene profile of that specific plant that attracts bugs? Because we know, like, certain smells and aromas were used to attract certain things, and that's why 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 you have like things like the the giant what's it called the the really gross flower, that really big gross one that smells like dead cobs, the corpse flower. You know, this way you have these unique variations on plants that really see certain terpenes and smells to attract certain various different things. I wonder if there might be something in your plants that's attracting that specific thing. And maybe they're just dying there for some reason, get stuck. But anyways, regardless, Matthew, I kind of posed a question to, to, to Claude and I wanted to get in on your opinion, what you're seeing in your neck of the woods. What's going on? What are some of the challenges? Is there anything specifically pest pressure heavy that you're noticing right now? Or are there any new challenges surfacing? Um, or maybe there's uh, some interesting predators you've seen more of lately. I'd love to live a rundown on what's going on in the world of Matthew 2022 mid late summer, you know, like what's going on there and what would you be doing to prepare your garden for the fall? So essentially, I just got done, I submitted to Skunk Magazine an article on the budworms because uh, they were by and far the most like deleterious pests that uh, clients that I worked with this year and also home growers um, who would send me messages uh, were dealing with. Um, so yeah, like uh, Cloud said, corn earworm, um, but also maybe some other Helicoverpa species, maybe um, the cotton bullworm and uh, the tobacco budworm as well. Um, so so that's kind of been like a harbinger of of, of problems for many for many growers. Um, I will also say that recently on my Instagram channel, um, I came across uh, somebody had sent me, and this will be like the third or fourth time that uh, somebody sent me a, a video of what seemed to be what I, I'm not sure because I don't, I didn't do the identification or anything like that. You know, I was only able to see the, the damage, but these are termites. Yeah, the termites. Inside the plant. <laughs> yeah. I think they're foremost in termites because I am only aware of uh, coptotermies and maybe there's a couple of different species maybe who could who could be um, the case. But I know that most infamously is uh, formosus. And um, I know that uh, they're incredibly, incredibly hard to um, eradicate because they feed on living and dead wood, which is unique to the foremost and termites. So that's why I think that that's what they are, because they're going after the living cannabis uh, uh, woody interior, which is pretty interesting. Um, I think that's sort of a unique problem that could get worse, potentially. Um, I'm curious what other people think about that. Uh, it's uh, another bug, totally. Uh, I find it uh, beautiful, but also creepy. At the same time, it's an invasive species. It's now getting closer to us. It's in Pennsylvania, New York State. Uh, the spotted lantern fly. Do you know if it oh, attacks yes. also? Yes, it does. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, oh, I've actually read some uh, Chinese research on the subject. Um, and uh, like in the, I want to say it was like in the 60s, maybe the 80s. I'm not remembering now the date, but it was pretty, pretty far ago. I want to say it might actually be the 60s. Um, but uh, they were noting that on, on hemp. Yeah, uh, on different like hemp cultures, they had like the nymphs and maybe sometimes the adults. They were saying, but there wasn't a whole lot of information. So I mean, I don't expect them to be against it because they feed on so many different kinds of plants. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of things feed on cannabis. Yeah, I think there's other plants that we have to be concerned uh, that will, they will attack. Uh, then before we're done with cannabis, but yeah, it might be just another uh, another pest <laughs> that we have to deal with in this changing world with the climate change and everything. And it's Speaking invasive of, species. <laughs> well, actually, that's one thing with the budworm. Um, I was reading, I did a presentation on the Future Canvas Project. Well, the F SCP-02 channel, which is what this is being live streamed on uh, on YouTube. Um, 
And uh, in that presentation, I, did, I read some research that was saying that above the north, the 40 degree north latitude line in North America, um, overwintering as pupae is a lot less likely and, and it's pretty lethal to them. Uh, but they still find their way to the next season because they, they move so so dang far, um, very many hundreds of kilometers um, in some cases, and it can drop over a thousand eggs. So, you know, they definitely get around. But uh, at least where you're at, um, it seems like maybe they don't overwinter as much, but I'm not sure if that's been your experience. There might be pockets where it's more habitable. I don't know. <clears throat> well, sorry about that. My apologies for the cough. Ron, did you? Or I'd love to love to to see if any of the experts. Ron, I saw you should put uh, put a photo up. I don't know if that's in reference to this thing or change a photo, but maybe you have an opinion in the in this area. Test Johnny. Anybody? You guys want to jump into this before we move on to the next point of conversation? Are we talking about only outdoor? Because uh, I grow a lot of outdoor, but but mainly indoors. And so some of the the like he said, when it, it, we're way up above the forty fifth parallel, or uh, we're like in Edmonton, we're up by fifty. I think I'm not sure exactly, but it gets so cold here that we don't have to deal with a lot of the nematodes and the things that people down in the warmer weather have to do have to deal with and we also clean I clean my greenhouse meticulously we go down all the edges remove any like a weed that will grow there because overwintering stuff likes to get like right around the ground level and overwinter and so you can get stuff to overwinter but uh, we're talking mainly about outdoor aren't we well for the budworm yeah but I mean it was I mean I took the question as a, an open-ended I mean it was addressed to me but I, I would I think it's very important to get the uh sort of impressions of people who are cultivating so uh, you know i'm always open to hearing what other people are dealing with um is another data point and that sort of a thing budworms for me though were kind of the not everyone got them and certainly I dealt with a lot of people who are indoor and didn't get them that way um primarily because of the physical barrier but um for people who were exposed it was a uh, very um onerous we got them in roseburg oregon but i haven't seen them up here in edmonton i have such a a a, a biodiverse bunch of uh, i grow in the middle of a quarter section and it, we're so biodiverse that so much stuff comes the only thing that i have any issues at all are just some standard black aphids or green aphids that if I grow a cultivar that has these grooves on cannabis, it can grow grooves up the stem and they, they tend to be able to hide from the hornets in the grooves. But uh, other than that, I've been really, really, really blessed to not have an issue except for one time when somebody uh, gave me a clone with uh, two spotted spider mites on it. That sounds very interesting. Um, how the sort of stem morphology could have that you know, sort of like limiting effect. The aphids really are, are you can, you can watch them. I've watched them on with a, like a little microscope where I can look in. And when the hornets go up to get them, the hornets go along and they'll pick them all out. They'll be th sitting there with their teeth or whatever, trying to pick them out of the cracks, but the aphids can hold on really tightly in the cracks. And if it's deep enough, the hornet can't pry them out of there. But, other than that, I mean, I have not sprayed or touched or done anything. And mine grows outside and have no budworms, no nothing, just the odd, you know, grasshopper that takes a bite. Uh, and uh, but I do, uh, and I don't know if this is, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't use it at the LP where I work for sure. But in the, I spray a mixture of diatomaceous earth and water with an airless sprayer on my plants prior to flipping them into flower outside. And that seems to, to diminish the, the caterpillars that I've had here in the past. So I don't have any because of that, but I don't believe it would be uh, able to be used commercially, but for the home grower, 
it, it works really well. And spraying it on as a slurry, it, it doesn't fall off. It just sticks on all the underside and all the sides of the leaves. And then you're, as it goes into flower, everything doesn't have any of that, that gray tint of the, of the diatomaceous earth on it. Uh, that's, a really interesting, that's a really interesting um, uh, anecdote. I like hearing that. There, there is a product that's approved by El Canada. Uh, that's Dietus Mesert. Uh, it's DX13, it's called. Um, so it, it is approved by El Canada. It's one of the 50 products. Um, it's a silicon dioxide present as 100% Dietus Mesert. Uh, it's, it's a concentration of 6.5%. Um, that can be used in cannabis grown indoors. Um, I know that it will be uh, not helpful for uh, other beneficials that are around. <laughs> I believe it will get them too. Uh, but uh, that's it. It, it can be used to. Uh, to they, they can also use it, uh, uh, like you know, uh, for other types of bugs that are in the building, like the the the, the, the cockroaches or whatever, the the, the silver fish and the crickets and whatever. So we did get a question in chat earlier. Um, what about the use of bacteria as defense or as, oh, actually Tess, it's kind of your question or comment. Did you want to comment or question more about the microbes uh, using microbiology there? You being our, our doctor in microbiology, like <laughs> your, your wheelhouse, right? Yeah, I was just going to kind of add in a couple other, you know, we were talking about chemicals you can use, diatomaceous earth, um, you know, different types of oils, but what about those beneficial microbes? Um, and what would you recommend for different types of pests? Because I know in my own garden at home, there's different like uh, subspecies that you use for different pests. Uh, and, you know, there's Wolbachia and then there's um, bacillus species and so just wondering are you using you wolbachia can... for for pest control i just know that it loves to kill insects i was doing a little bit of research on it back in the day um with an entomologist but um i don't use wolbachia in my garden but i wonder if there are like untapped microbes out there you know we really heavily rely on bacillus and mm, trichoderma more for other uh fungal contaminants but like what do you think about using those um and then wendy actually had a really good point in the chat too when you have a diverse soil system and a good microbiome or kind of those microbes that kind of defend the plant that can also help um so what is your what are all the the bug people's um opinions on microscopic bugs i think that with regards to the microbiome comment um, I generally tend to agree, but I will say that I think a lot of people, for very obvious reasons, don't actually know what the composition of those microbes are. Not only endophytes in the plant, um, specifically cannabis even, but also in the rhizosphere and then sort of the general bulk soil. Um, and I also, I think that it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a prevalent and sort of simplified perspective about the microbiome to say that uh, diversity equals good. In a lot of cases, it does. However, I think it's important to at least acknowledge that, um, first of all, like you mentioned, Tess, just now adroitly, that there's different subspecies um, which can have totally different effects and might not even work well together uh, with other microbes, you know, in your in your um, you know, microbial soil mixture. Um, they might not play nicely with the endophytes in inside the plant. Uh, I was just reading and shared a research report that uh, was just published talking about how um, through several accessions, um, the seed endophytes in cannabis seeds specifically, were um, a lot of them uh, housed bacteria that some of them were able to solubilize, uh, I think it was phosphorus. Um, and also able to do other things as well. Several bacteria, um, especially in the bacillus and pain of bacillus genera, uh, they were also antifungal 
and they and there were also other seed endophytes that were fungi like fusarium um, and various other ones. Uh, I want to say Rhizoctonia was also one of them, but I might be remembering that one wrong. But there was like several. Fusarium was one of them as well. And like I, I don't know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> not to ramble, but like um, not all the quote unquote good guys like necessarily even like each other, quote unquote, like they might compete with each other. And I'm as a microbiologist, um, I'm sure you can appreciate the, you know, the in, very interesting and intricate nature of a lot of those interactions. Um, and I just feel like that's oh, yeah. really important. It's just really important to consider because people think they apply multiple products and they'll all work out right. And they don't realize that like, like, for example, in a lot of plants, they might, um, uh, you know, a, a beneficial might be somewhat beneficial, but another microbe could have been way more beneficial. But because one relationship happened before the other one established, they can't really work together, which is kind of unfortunate. And then they might not, the plant might not even be able to sort of uh, uh, reject it very easily. Anyways, um, I'm curious yeah, to get your take that. on that. You know, that's a really good point. You know, these little ecos, these micro ecosystems that form, first of all, are really transient just because microbes live pretty fast and furious. Their half-lives are much shorter than um, the cannabis plant for sure, the insects that are on there for sure. Um, and so they're doubling, depending on their environment, they can double every hour or two um, if they got everything they need. Um, so they can reproduce pretty rapidly and outcompete each other and fight each other and send little antimicrobial missiles at each other. Um, and so, yeah, I agree with you. I, I do think sometimes, even though I love microbes and think that they can be used very effectively as beneficials, uh, they can be inappropriately used um, in cannabis. I've seen it misused. Uh, on, in foliar sprays during flower and then those clients of mine failed for aerobic bacteria uh, because they just sprayed the crap out of their flowering plants and like guess what those bacillus species form spores and those spores can survive in your environment for pretty much forever so it i think that using them and also beneficial insects or beneficial sprays and then like living soils I also agree with you, Matthew, in that like folks just don't know what's in there because um, you can't see microbes and to be able to identify them, it's kind of expensive. And like I said, it's transient, so you're only getting a snapshot. So you, the information you get might not be representative of the ecosystem over time. So I actually am really super interested in this and there's a lot of cool folks doing research on it um, and a lot of cool folks making these beneficials um, so I'm really hoping to see more research come out on this so that we can start making in a, you know, in a manufacturing environment, we can make more informed decisions about when is best to spray and when microbes might com be competing against each other, what microbes don't blend well together and things like that. So good points, Matthew. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. I use that actually to my benefit. What you're saying could be actually be a problem. I use it on a day-to-day -day, uh, at an LP to my benefit. What I do is like today I sprayed um, on the soil, I sprayed BioGuard because BioGuard, and it has to be mixed like one quarter of the strength that it says it is. And then I'll just basically top dress the soil under my plants to get rid of thrips and it breaks the, their life cycle. And it also wipes out any fungus that you might have in the, in the meantime but it doesn't work in a symbiotic way with the plant itself. And, uh, and also the plants just hate it. So you don't want to get BioGuard on the plants. It's just, it's poison, but not, you know, in a, I'm saying it in a very loose manner. It's, it's just the, it's toxic to the plants. It burns the leaves, they dry up and it's just not good. You can't mix it weak enough to, for the plants to like it, but I found that I can use it on the soil and, and deal, just take thrips right out of the, the, the picture because it ruins their life cycle. In the same way, I spray something called Canna PM, and that goes over the top, and I spray that up through second week of flower, and that keeps uh, from PM, and I know that that's a, a competing 
biological, uh, some sort of a microbe that competes and won't let the powdery mildew take play, take uh, effect. And we used it to clean up an outbreak. So uh, that works too. So in addition to working symbiotically with the plant, which I do, some seeds, I'll pop a seed. If I know that it came from an area that has powdery mildew or other stuff from the grower or somebody I don't know, I'll soak them in hydrogen peroxide first to sterilize the seed. And then I'll re-inoculate the seed to pick up a uh, uh, the the bacteria and whatever that's good in that, so that it it starts life with a little something because these are the seeds come preloaded with a, a natural flora like we we do when we're born in our stomach from our mothers. So anyway, that's just to my two cents. Uh, Those are all really great points, very relevant, and I think helping having the human microbiome angle helps you know kind of articulate that point. Uh, BioGuard, is it a chlorine product? No, BioGuard okay. is a, a biological. Uh, I'd have to go pull it to look at what. Okay, you are you know, not I, talking about BotanyGuard, our competitor? It, yeah, BotanyGuard, BotanyGuard, okay. maybe. Okay, oh, yeah, it's different. different. <laughs> yeah, over your drench. We're working to get it on the label this year <laughs> as a drench. I was, think, I was thinking BotanyGuard then, sorry. Yeah, I see, uh, I see. And the canapeum is also called actinovit. It's Streptomyces lidicus. Yep. According to uh, Dr. Punja, uh, I, I talk with often, um, it, it's better if you use it in prevention, then it can work. If uh, something is already happening, then it's too late. Uh, it takes yeah, too long to exactly. colonize. It takes too yeah, long to colonize. Yeah, we use it as a pro prophylactic every single week. I spray with it regardless, but yet we don't have to burn sulfur. But to clean, when we had the problem, we had to clean, like starting from the mother room all the way up, you know, and so we wound up doing a harvest and getting that out and then and then keeping it clean all the way up and then it, it, it just went away. And we kept the conditions uh, the best, so it, it just went away. And like it was said before, uh, it's always like when you're using microbials or bacteria or things like that, it's always to get the best results is to use it as a preventive. Um, so it occupies the space of the other pathogens and things like that because it's not that efficient when the disease is going on. It's really uh, caught on the plant. And so it's better to, it can be very efficient if your plant is balanced, it's healthy, and you're using this type of beneficials to colonize your root system with trichoderma or glioclidium and uh, to use Treptomyces lidicus or your or your bacillus on your, your leaf, um, uh, I mean, on the upper, uh, on the canopy. Um, this could be very useful, I, I believe. Uh, I'm in favor of that too. But uh, we, we have to know how to use it. And preventive is the way to do it because then it's just like, uh, it's, a, it's not cost effective, it's not really, it's it's not worth it. It's uh, you really have to use it preventively. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like with the budworms, um, you know, you had asked about which ones to use certain um, you know microbial pesticides, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, Izawi, or and Kirstaki. I, I hear a lot uh, recommended by entomologists who are actually doing research on such things, like uh, Whitney Crenshaw. Um, I myself um, have had good results with that as well um, as uh, Helicobex, yeah. Um, and that's a um, Helicoverpa nucleo polyhedrovirus. And that's a very specific virus that goes after the larva. And that works really well for a lot of people too. But the problem with them both is um, like you've mentioned already, you have to apply them preventively um, a lot of people like to trap, um, at least in non-cannabis spaces. I often, I'm introducing this technique to people who are not familiar with it, but you can trap with pheromones, for example, and then kind of tell the activity in your area, which is very, very useful. Um, but yeah, if you already kind of know seasonally when they start to be active and that sort of a thing, then it, then you do have to apply it, but then you have to kind of reapply it a lot. And it's very expensive. Um, to do that sort of a thing. And 
you know, another interesting thing is if you don't get enough coverage or you somehow only infect or inflict a sublethal dose somehow, some way, um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these larvae, I did an extensive, you know, research, uh, like I just, I didn't conduct research. I just looked at other people's research. I just want to be fair about that. But to prepare for my presentation, I was going over some of the various things that I'd already downloaded. A, a while ago and just kind of sort of rehoning my knowledge base and and it turns out that a lot of these helicoverpa larvae are really good at developing resistances against the cryoproteins and other sorts of toxins that the um like bacillus produces that kills them um even the virus that i mentioned as well um i think that people and I recently encountered somebody who was very obstinate about this point that, well, they use BT and it's fine and they don't have any problems um, ever. And they're not going to consider the possibility for pest resistance. And I think that's uh, folly. It's incredibly um, poor judgment because all kinds of uh, Lepidopterous pests in particular, but the Helicoverpa in general, they're so good at getting resistance to chemical resistances. They develop and then they interbreed with other um, others of their species or even other species like um, the cotton bollworm, for example. And it's just uh, I think it's a it's an aspect of the budworm problem that a lot of people are barely even registering. And I know it's a little high concept, but um, biocontrols can be resisted, especially microbial ones, because the compounds or the proteins that they're using that are affecting the the insect you know over time you know just like our own immune system they can develop resistances to that and there's a big selection pressure to do so in nature so anyways i wanted to sort of bring that up as well i totally support what you said uh, matthew uh we we distribute bioprotect plus it's a, a bt uh, k uh bacillus syringes cure um it's just been approved this uh, late June for outdoor use in cannabis. It's just been approved before in greenhouse and indoors. I don't know why it was just for that. Uh, but the thing is, I don't like to use it. It's too general. So I much prefer the trichogramma, which are more uh, that will work any weather except for really pouring rain. Um, so when you use BT, you have to have the right conditions, not too much wind. No, no rain, things like that. So you might miss the target, uh, the the size of the larvae, because when you use BT, the larvae have to be very small for it to be efficient. And like you said, there's a lot of resistance being built right now. The corn borer is getting resistant. There's been a lot of abuse, especially with the GMO corn. Um, people were supposed to- Especially so, yeah. Yeah, they were supposed to plant patches of non-GMO corns. And some would just keep it because they knew no inspectors would come and check that. And so they've been uh, really cheap, certain farmers, and they made, they created more conditions to make it more resistant faster. So trichogrammas, they, they won't get uh, used to them. <laughs> I mean, they, it takes too long to evolve to, uh, uh, for that to be, uh, I don't see it to, to, to build any resistance to them. So that's the way we go. And I don't like Bacillus transgenesis in a way because uh, the the BTI, the Bacillus transgenesis israelensis, it could be very efficient. And I used to use it uh, before in the early 90s. We used to get mosquito dunks, like these um, little pellets or like uh, discs made of, um, of uh, cork. Anyways, it was uh, infused with the BTI. And we put that in our water reservoirs, and a week and a half later, there were no more fungus not to be seen for for a, for a long time. So it could be uh, very efficient, the BTI against dipterous flies like mosquitoes, things like that. But like here in my province, there are over uh, still twelve uh, municipalities are using it. They're spraying the lakes around the the swamps and whatever. So uh, what it does, it creates it uh, it creates a mass killing of all the dipterous, dipterous flies and then all the swallows and other birds that need them uh, really it really really affects them uh, badly so i'm not in favor of that and now there is 
nice technology that is not a gadget anymore. If you cannot stand mosquitoes in your backyard, there's all these thermal and whatever things, gadgets that really work now. Uh, so there's no excuse of using BTI anymore. It was just my little capsule I wanted to to bring out. <laughs> those those middle species, those like swallows and stuff like that, they're they're like. They, while they while they do eat some of those, a lot of them also grow bigger and eat the larger problematic pests like the worms and stuff. So they could be, well, a lot of people look at a bird population as potentially being a problem. You know, like you can watch a lot of the regenerative focus stuff and it's like the, the, having a, a decent sized bird population is a sign that you have a very healthy and diverse profile all the way up there's lots of bugs eating other bugs eating other bugs to the to the point that it's there's large enough bugs to carry the feeding of birds which is awesome and really cool yeah in my uh fungus snap presentation i mentioned a few times at this point but basically i had to leave in the example of um uh, the true high which is the four pest campaign in china if you've never heard of this you should look it up long story short uh, a lot of birds eat a lot of grain. So they decided to kill um, specifically the Eurasian tree sparrows. And then they really end up with an even worse uh, pest problem, uh, specifically flies and um, some other pests as well. I think a beetle species of some kind eating all their grain. So like whenever somebody says what you just said, I'm always reminded that, um, you know, sometimes if you're over exuberant in that way, it can lead to some problems ecologically. And we've definitely seen that in many other examples. So be careful everyone, <laughs> be responsible. Don't kill the birds. Exactly, exactly. And you should favor them like uh, uh, have bird houses and everything. There's a organic farm not far from my place. and. They like this year, they did this spring. I saw them put up like a lot of new bird houses everywhere and uh, to favor them uh, in their field um, for any crop you're growing. In fact, uh, it's just uh, something before I forget, there's um, it's not a new disease. I used to see it in the when I used to scout for the Minister of Agriculture for I used to see it often in beans and pole beans and everything like that. It's white, white mold. So uh, sclerotinia. So I saw it uh, happen in cannabis a couple of occasions this year, and uh, it, it is uh, it will happen on the the stem of the plants or uh, elsewhere on the plant, and it, it's like a white fuzz and it's uh, dark dark sunken lesions, and uh, it's the sclerosia, which are like uh, bodies that will overwinter, and uh, you can f see them on, on the stem or usually inside the stem when you break it open. And um, if you it ever happens to your plant, you have to make sure that you destroy and you burn these plants, the sclerosia, so you, and you, the, the, the bits of soil around it. So that way you don't uh, disperse this uh, disease. Uh, it doesn't overwinter in your field uh, because it could be uh, propagated uh, as through other means. But I mean, you're going to be sure. Uh, it's also important if you add very heavy powder mildew, things like that too, that you try to burn all your residue, uh, really destroy them and really compose them really with a heat compost really well. Um, so you get rid of it because they, the powder mildew itself, the spore, uh, will remain living like uh, without any living host for maybe a week or two or max uh, before it dies. But, but it, if it leads a living host, uh, but it can survive also on um, uh, like, a dead, like rotting dead matter. Yeah. So, uh, at least Cleocystes will form. So, um, so you, you have to make sure that for sure it can be brought by somewhere, by the wind, by other factors. But I mean, you in the fall, we want to be sure for what happened in our field. To be sure that they like check if you had a fit, check your compost pile, uh, check if even if you are not you are not producing seeds. Uh, usually on outdoor plants, there'll be the occasional one or two seeds per big plant, 
that were formed like as a survival mechanism and these plants because I am telling that story because it happened in New Brunswick and in BC at the same time. Uh, people had the cannabis aphid come back from the dead, from, <laughs> almost from their compost piles uh, on volunteer, uh, volunteer plants. The same story happened the same week on both sides of Canada. Uh, so that's why I'm telling you that's another thing we have to watch in the fall. If you had aphids, make sure that you try to destroy as much as possible. Uh, the thing is, is that they will have laid eggs. So you have to be prepared the next year because they tend to be now, uh, uh, I found that they are now endemic uh, cannabis aphids in Ontario. Um, I believe it's the same and now we've, we've been proved that it's the same in New Brunswick and in BC. So I, I believe they must survive in the egg stage. Um, that's it. And they, they, they've been, uh, they were already on the first volunteer plants before the actual plants. They wanted to plant from their greenhouse into the field. The ones that are already in the compost pile were already infested. Uh, that started to get infested by cannabis aphids. So this this is to check. Also, what I wanted to add, um, people, what when they grow some new strains outside and they find a new prized one, a uh, new strain that looks uh, really interesting or promis- like uh, amazing and things like that, sometimes they'll try to bring it back inside so you bring you might bring back a lot more than your genetics inside so i would advise doing a strict quarantine a real quarantine is really long some people don't want to go through that i think i believe i don't know if you you know uh you support that it would be 21 days in fact <laughs> yeah it's yeah i agree uh, a lot of people don't want to do that and it's exactly like so i would take many cuttings in fact if you don't want to go through that um of your favorite plants and once they've taken then you're okay and then you could do a a more like um localized quarantine i would say like you could check them closely and try to save your genetic but even then it's hard sometimes to uh it's possible always possible to do cutting of a advanced flowering plant but uh, you take it uh, in the bottom but that's where you usually will bring in more chances to bring in pests who at the same time inside your facility, but if you take very small cuttings, you should be all right. I uh, do that. I do that often, Claude, but I never bring a plant that's rooted in the house. I bring in mm-hmm. cuttings and I put them in bleach water, completely submerged in bleach water for a length of time to completely sterilize them, and then I root the plant out. Perfect. That's one I forgot to add. And the bleaching and the other types of disinfection methods. So we're, we're, <clears throat> we're not talking bleach, so we're talking like hydrogen peroxide, right? Are we, are bleach. We using bleach? Uh, bleach, I, bleach. I, I use bleach. Okay. I have, I've, I've heard of hydrogen peroxide, never heard of bleach. But can, okay, can you run, like, you, you have an extraordinary amount of experience. This is something that you, you're best in. And this pro- your process. Can you run us through your process a little bit so we can have a, bit of a better understanding of that, Ron? Okay, uh, I try to uh, get low clones normally, but that's where the e- the eggs and the bugs and the bug pack is usually often. So, it, uh, a- apical meristem cultures are a little bit harder to root, but they do root better when the plant is closer to flower or pr- right about when it's going to flip. So, if I'm going to bring something in the house, I get it right about now. It's about the time that they're starting to flip to flower or whenever, but right when you get that little lighter color on the inside of the apical meristem. And then I just bring them in. I put about, oh, I'd say five or six drops of bleach, a little, you know, more bleach than you think would be okay for the plants in a mayonnaise jar. I stuff the cuttings in there and fill it, you know, it's full of water and bleach and I completely submerge the plants in there the cuttings and leave them in there about 15 minutes and then shake them out, bring them out. They're a little bit sloppy, a little bit lime green and funky, but they always live and root. And that way I bring something in that that's clean. And you, you, before that, I also look at it with a loop really close to make sure there's no eggs that, that I'm missing that are under, under anything, but usually on the apical mare stem, you know, the, the nodes will get closer together as it gets closer to flower. And it's pretty easy to, 
to take a look at it and see what you got. But if you bring a, a, any kind of plant into your facility or into your house, you stand in a really good chance of screwing the pooch. And, and I hate having to clean up a mess. So I've just gotten to the point where even if somebody gives me a clone that's rooted, I wash the dirt off, I stick it in bleach water, leave it completely under, I look at it all over, I defoliate it to where there's nothing left but a stalk and an apical mare stem, and I've been able to stay clean. But you got to be uh, real vigilant. And the bigger the grow is, the bigger the downside if you bring in spotted spider mites or something that's a pain in the butt to get rid of. So two questions. One, what's the dilution ratio that you use for your bleach? Uh, um, someone in the comments is asking on future cannabis project side, Ron. I, I put six drops in a quart mayonnaise jar, but you can put as much as a, a, a half a teaspoon in there. You just have less contact time is all. And so I usually leave them there for about 15 minutes and put them in the chlorinated water. And any uh, bugs drown. If if I have any bugs, I'll just go to a different plant anyway. But just to make sure there's no eggs or nothing, that bleaching just gets rid of microbes, gets rid of all kinds of stuff. So, and and second question: Do you do anything afterwards as a follow up to kind of re microbe, re inoculate, re 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 kind of fix plant? Because that's that 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 would probably pretty mean this <laughs> poor thing. Right? Yeah, you, no, you I, I, I do not. I do not until it gets gets roots on it. And then once it gets root on it, I, I hit it with uh, I inoculate it pretty good. And I grow JDAM, a modified JDAM. And so so I'm always putting if it's going outside, it's getting a lot of microbes any anyway. And so but I do try to hit it with micro risey and just the, the different stuff to put it in. But I don't really worry about it because I'm going into natural soil and my soil is really alive. So awesome. I just wanted to say we were at about an hour and 10 minutes in. We're in our last 20 minutes. So sorry, I got a spot probably speaking in a little bit because I've got my microphone a little bit further away. I, I, I managed my child pulled my headphones out of my phone and the plug for the headphones stayed in the phone. The headphones did not. So anyways, they are broken. So I'm using my phone a little bit differently today. So I apologize if my audio has been a little bit off. It's um, been pretty nice. <laughs> kids what are you gonna do um what i wanted to jump in and and, and ask and and, and and a just say thank you all for showing in is if you have a question that you want right now to come up and ask um and and i would definitely suggest doing that put your hand up come join the conversation come ask a question to the expert we only go to 6 30 so we do have a hard stop at that point in time, I really love the segues that we've kind of dug into and kind of the layering that we, we've talked about. And what I would kind of like to do while we see if anybody would like to come up and ask a question um, from the audience and, and ask it physically, I'd love to go through each person kind of ask, looking at fall, in, let me know what location, where, where you are in the world and what your fall looks like. What are you personally doing in your garden to ensure your IPM and your, your pest management control and you that you're being preventative because if, if there's anything that I've heard in every single one of these episodes Claude because you've been here for every single one of the episodes most of you guys have been here for every single one of these best IPM episodes and it is always prevention is key it has always been prevention is key. It's always about prevention and, and, and it's always about making sure it never happens to begin with. So let's go through and kind of ask each one of the experts what your what what are you going to do? And maybe is there some little secret thing that you're willing to share that might be a little bit different that maybe doesn't even do anything um, practically, but it makes you feel good. So why don't you start test and we'll roll all the way around to Dr. Anibis. It's good to see you. Awesome. Sorry, my dog was just barking at me to throw her frisbee. Um, so, you know, I mostly work with indoor cultivators. So that does kind of put blinders on me as far as what seasonality, like the big dramatic seasonality differences are. I mean, even in indoor environments, you do see ebbs and flows with different types of uh contaminants and things like that and um, my dog just jumped into my planter okay <laughs> sorry um so you know as it cools down a little bit more and um you know the maybe it's more moist here in colorado it's pretty dry most of the time so uh 
when we do see issues, they tend to be kind of more aspergillus, maybe botrytis issues that go on. Um, for insects, uh, in my personal garden, I had a lot of issues actually with earwigs earlier this year um, with my cabbage and my kale. Um, and they just destroyed those leafy plants. Um, and so I just went out with my shop back <laughs> and my uh, neem oil and sprayed. But honestly, like as far as uh, pest management, um, I think that other folks here might have a little bit better description on what, how to be prepared for the fall and uh, what to do. But that's kind of been my approach. Wait, 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 wait. Before we do, <laughs> I just, I need you to explain how a shop vac and neem oil go together yes. exactly. Because, okay, so because these, that, these mother trucking earwigs, <laughs> I will tell you what, like, I don't know what it was, but everyone that I know in, in my area in, of Denver this year had so many earwig issues. I think it was like dry. And so they were eating just like anything that they could. And they love to live under, you know, logs and pots and things like that. So I was like turning over everything in my yard and just like shop backing them up. <laughs> so okay. maybe so not, the, maybe we not applicable to cannabis. No, 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 I, no. I was not, but I would, would I go, I'd, I'd go through and I would, you know, turn over logs and, and I have a lot of like stuff in my yard. So I like move stuff and, and then just suck it up. And then I go through and spray kind of down closer to the bottom of my plants with neem oil, especially like the kale and stuff. Cause I didn't want to spray the leaves directly, but it helped so much. And now now we've gotten a little bit of rain, so it's not as bad, but those earwigs, I couldn't believe what they did. I was so mad at them. And they have butt pinchers, which is You gotta leave us on the butt pinchers. Did she? Yeah, they have like one, one, They were in our house too. And they like got on my husband and in the middle of the night, they pinched him in the arm. And he was like, what pinched me? And it was an earwig butt. Yeah, some of those, uh, uh, you know. I, I think I've ever strain at your house, just so you know, Tess. That's never going to happen. I, like, I don't care where, like, I am never going to not think about those the being pinched by an earwig. So if I'm ever in the area, <laughs> I'll stay at the hotel. You know that. No, well, there we've 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 managed to regulate them indoors, but uh, you can still stay with us. We got a bunk bed. No, nope, as far as I'm considered, your house is infested with earwigs, and I will never even walk into it at this point. I love and appreciate you, Tess, but I'm panicking a little bit right now. They could never get past all your hair, London. They would stay out of your ears. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty creepy. They are really, really creepy, but um. Yeah, I I complete, will complete sarcasm. Now, I'm joking. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> but I will pass this now on to to Matthew. I think he probably has some better recommendations. And I... so I would say that the best thing that somebody could do always, no matter what, and it's 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 still unfortunately uncommon enough that I think it really does bear repeating, especially as there's n more new growers. Um, growing is to to scout your plants, be vigilant. You know, um, look at the leaves, look under the leaves, learn about various pests that can go after cannabis and other plants that you're growing. For example, um, you know, introduce a quarantine. Like Cloud was saying, great idea. Uh, if you're able to do that, um, it's always a, a, a major benefit. Uh, some of these pests, you can't really visually see that they're there uh, until, you know, some some thrips, you know, they oviposit into the tissue or the first like 120 hours of lead's powdery mildew is like basically invisible to the unaided eye. So, you know, um, just because you don't see it does not mean that it's not there. And that can go for a lot of things. Um, so those are just general things that are really helpful. For here in the late summer, fall, autumn, 
Um, obviously, budworms have been a huge problem. I just want to emphasize that. Sclerotinia, uh, like was mentioned earlier, um, absolutely the Christothecia, you know, these sort of, uh, sort of super spores that, uh, are, you know, defended from all kinds of environmental stressors that would kill other spores that they produce allows them to overwinter on dead plant tissue. If you're the kind of person who will take leaves and reintroduce them kind of raw into your substrate, that could be a problem if you dealt with a, a pathogen like sclerotinia or uh, various other pathogens that do that. Even powdered mildew sometimes produce uh, Clisiothesia. So definitely something to watch out for as well. And um, if you don't already have like an SOP of some kind, if you don't already track kind of seasonally, if it's relevant to you, especially outdoor, then um, I, I highly recommend sort of organizing that. You don't have to break your, you know, budget or your back, you know, trying to document every little thing. A lot of people find it cathartic. But ultimately, uh, knowing when you tend to get pests, having a plan uh, for various pests, even ones you have not interacted with before because you were prudent and you looked up some of the various cannabis pests you could potentially get is like step zero. And it'll definitely benefit you coming into the springtime when everything starts to wake up again and uh, find your plants attractive to feast on. So that's my opinion about that. I totally support what he says. That's what I wanted to say almost <clears throat> to take note for next year, um, what went on that year. And also, take into account that you might have been lucky and certain pests might have not shown up or they haven't shown up because they're coming your way. Um, like um, the corn borer, it's really a problem in Eastern Canada. It's not a problem out West and I don't wish it out West, but it might come someday like the spotted lantern fly, like I was saying, they're coming up North. Agreed. Uh, so uh, we have to watch for, uh, for, for other uh, like, Pests that might show up and the ones that were there and the ones that could be sporadic like let's say you have a near a farmer that will cut the zay and there's trips in it and then there's a a sudden invasion of trips in your field and then you have to react uh but um that's it besides that uh that's it to prepare for next year um take notes to have a good plan a good prevention plan then it won't cost you much uh, as uh, you, if you have to react and be in the creative mode, then it must cost you much more of uh, trying to apply beneficial, and it won't be uh, maybe uh, it won't work as you planned it uh, because it's getting out of hand and things like that. So good prevention. It's like a good bodyguard, a good camera, security system. In fact, I compare it sometimes, if in its uh, cheap analogy. But anyways, it's a uh, it goes a uh, that, that way so uh that's from that's what i wanted to add all right so i kind of want to echo what uh matt was saying and really like a quarantine process is it's huge um you know along with scouting those are very important practices to to incorporate into your grow um um, some other things that it, that I really found uh, help out are kind of if you have pests and you know you have pests in one particular spot or one particular room, uh, it's usually a good idea to, to have that be like the last place that you're going to be during the day unless something else requires you to be there. But, you know, walking through and checking everything else and then and then going to the place where there is uh, an infestation. So you're not like brushing up against plants or touching plants and then spreading them around the rest of the facility. So in my experience, it's usually like a, a good idea if you don't have pests to kind of start, like work your way downstream, like start in the, the most important rooms, like your money making rooms, like your flower room or your clone room, if you're a nursery and work your way back to like, to where your moms are going to be or where there's going to be uh, a higher likelihood of pests to be and you're not going to contaminate your 
you know, the rooms that are really responsible or areas that are responsible for making you um, money. Um, and on a smaller scale, like for my home grow, something I do is I make sure before I go into my grow that I, I change my clothes, I take my shoes off. Um, you know, I have dreadlocks. So I like put my hair up and I put it, wrap it in something. If I've been in someone else's grow or it, you know, I know, and I've, I've worked at places that have cannabis aphids, you know, pretty bad infestation and I'll come home, take my clothes off, you know, wrap my hair up and I'll, I'll still end up sometimes they're a pest are so persistent. So if you allow them the chance to, to kind of hitchhike on you, they're so good and they want to live and they're really, um, you know, a lot of times they're really adept at survival and they'll find a way to get to your plants. So you know, really taking those precautions and assuming that they are, are, you're carrying pests with you from wherever you were outside and to just be aware because, yeah, it's a lot easier, as London said, to prevent pests um, in the first place than it is to get rid of them. Um, and especially once you get into flower or you have a mom that's, you know, very large and hard to get full coverage. Um, and I guess for my last, my last little tidbit is, um, you know, full coverage when you are, when you do have pests, making sure that you're, you're getting entire, your, your entire plant covered when you're spraying, um, and having a good sprayer to do that. Um, if your plants are small enough, something that I found that works extremely well for me is do like a dunk. Um, you know, like I, I make my own, uh, uh, insecticidal soap. And I will like, as I'm up potting things or bringing things into my flower room, I will dunk them and I'll kind of hold them in the solution for, you know, a good like 20, 30 seconds and then take them out. And, you know, it's a great way to, to eliminate any pests that you have on the spot on your plants. And uh, I'm all finished. Well, that, that's good. A lot of good advice given here. Uh, I like what Matthew said. I did. I'm all over that. I did that. And Claude, you know, you guys got to be uh, uh, observe your plants and know what you got. It, it, indoor and outdoor are very, very different. Like I work at an LP. When I walked in the door this morning, I walked in the LP. I changed into my scrubs. I I I sewed my. Uh, I put on my separate shoes, separate clothes, all together. I sewed my hands and arms that after I washed them all the way up at the top. And then I went into the facility. I walked to every single inch of the facility. Like Johnny said, starting from my mother room to the propagation room and on out into the flower rooms. And I, I keep a, a view of everything that's going on and I know everything that's going on. So I look, I go, what do I have any pest pressure anywhere in here and where is it and what stage is it at? And, you got to you got to be observing outdoors. I find it being quite different. I'm sitting right outside next to my garden right now. My left hand is sitting on about a, a four foot bud. That's just ridiculous. But when I was sitting out here and listening to you guys chat, uh, a couple of the, my favorite hornets, I just love them. I, I should give them names, but they come and it's just starting working up and down the stalks and and going all over and then i've got these little spiders with little white asses on them but no no ass biters like uh tess said but i i watch the outdoors you got to give it time if you don't give it time and you don't let the nature come in and 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 do what it's going to do if you try to do something you might get the ecosystem off a kilter like like somebody like claude said about killing all the mosquitoes and then the swallows have nothing to eat so so like I, I would get a big breakout of aphids and I see them up and down the stocks and go oh, dang aphids and then you wait about four days and then some predator uh, shows up and it just eats the hell out of the aphids and it moves on somewhere else until someone deposits some more aphids so I've been able to I can grow outdoors and I just have no problems except for some problems that I I create myself and and I think uh, by by not having the optimum conditions, I got pythium on a, on a stalk by, by an area where I had a water leak and it kept the whole area just constantly wet. But this time of year, you also, where I live in the Edmonton area, there's powdery mildew everywhere. And and somebody touched on this, but they did. we didn't break it open very much. Having plants that are powdery mildew and bud rot resistant, it, it, 
it, it, I can't tell you how important that is. I use river water and, and my, I'm going to be on the garden show tomorrow with uh, London, the, the more cannabis for breakfast or whatever, but I'll be able to show some pictures about how I just spray river water all over my buds, all the way up to week six of flower and just completely soak them bottom to top all the time with, with that. And so if I'm going to bud rot them, I'm going to bud rot them and take them out of my stable and I'm not going to breed with them anymore. So I got stuff that I, when I do flower it out, it can carry a nice big fat bud and I don't have to deal with the bud rot. So uh, a lot of good information from Claude and Matthew and everybody. So just know what you're doing and keep an eye on it. And, uh, uh, but outdoor and indoor are way different, different uh, uh, bailiwicks as far as I'm concerned. Boom. I mean, can I just, I just want to jump in for a second, but I just think that's a really interesting point. I was going to put kind of pose, pose it to Anna in a bit is what do we think about the suggestion of what, what are we doing with it? Are we allowing plants that are susceptible to these problems and continuing to breed them? Or do we eliminate them from the process altogether? And I think you, you, you touched it really well there, Ron, is I think we should get rid of it. But Damon, what do you have suggested for those? going into the fall season to take care of their plants in your in your in your freaking cold ass area well yeah i'm in saskatchewan but it's exactly what ron said with your outdoor plants you really just want to let mother nature do it you're going to end up with bugs dust a whole bunch of bertoline right and bertoline is fecal matter from birds um water works wonders but yeah it's like what ron said outside you just want to let it things take their course um indoors like even in a greenhouse then that's yeah you need those preventative measures and it's like matthew pointed out (sighs) research every single type of pest that you can get uh the boar beetles mites aphids everything and have have a you know like for for a home grower our standard operating procedures or their standard operating procedures, you can just keep that in your mind. Like, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth dot, dot, dot. Right. So as long as you're aware of what could possibly go sideways, you're going to have fewer problems that way. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question, London. Boom. 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 Hey, London. Yeah. Who's the other dude in your picture there? I see you got the weed Jesus look going on, which Thanks. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, the unicorn cup. It's be cool. Cool. Thought no, who who is that? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. No, who's the other Kevin guy in the picture Jodry. with you? Kevin Jodry. Kevin. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. No, he's, he's too American for you. And Dr. Annabeth, good to see you. How are you? So, uh, you guys, I'm so sorry I'm late to the party. I've been very absent and uh, I just thought I'd pop in and say hi. And uh, I caught the tail end of a really super cool conversation. Um, so you had a question for me, London, right? I don't mean to interrupt, but I cannot hear Anna at all. You- you're very quiet. You're coming okay. through quiet. Is that better? I hope you're, you're far talking your mic a little bit. It's all the way up to my face. How's that for everybody? You're... Is that better? I do sense the um, the lower volume. Fuck. The force is not strong with this one. We love Hi, you, Anna. Anna. That's why you got to be at the start for the mic check. <laughs> she was fine before. Is this any better? A little bit. Slightly. Just try taking the headphones right out. I don't have any headphones in this time. Okay. So you're, is your face about, next to the okay. phone? How about this? I can hear you pretty good. What about you guys? I don't believe it, it changed much She's for pretty me, quiet. But... She's pretty Hold quiet on. for me. Uh, okay, Dr. Anibus, we're going to come back to you next week with an awesome question about what we should do when it comes to cannabis breeding genetics. Okay. Always helpful. <laughs> I'll just yell into my phone. <laughs> that that actually kind of works. 
it does sort of work. So, so while you're yelling, while you're yelling, Doctor Anubis, we'd love to know what your thoughts on uh, breeding into um, defensive genetic behavior. I, I'm saying this in the worst possible way because I'm a bit tired. Uh, Resistance. Like, where are we far, at? You know what I'm saying. Okay, so amazingly, my boyfriend is not here so i can yell at the top of my lungs if i want to and not wake him up he's gone to colorado for a vacation can you guys hear me uh yeah better actually yeah, you works. increase the game <laughs> so my first thought is is that we have cultivated and coddled this plant for you know thousands of years it's used to being cultivated. It's used to being babied. It likes being um, selected. Like we have shaped it into this thing that we like. It is super susceptible to all kinds of pests and diseases because we made it that way. We looked after it. We made it our baby. Um, and it's not surprising to me that... A lot of cannabis uh, that is cultivated um, in terms of, you know, for, for the, especially for the flowers, that it's super susceptible to uh, pests and several diseases. Uh, and I don't know if we're breeding weak plants. Yeah, probably. Is there anything we can do about it in the short term? Probably not. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, there were so many interesting things that everyone had to say about, you know, my, you know, like the ecosystem and the, you know, the microbes, they have their own ecosystem and how all of these things interact in outdoor versus indoor. Honestly, I can say, I don't know. That's about all I can say. Um, it's really interesting to me how this is all uh, folding out. But, you know, I'm a, I am I look at things in terms of an evolutionary scale, hundreds, thousands of years. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm just going to say I don't know. That's the safe answer. And I'm going with... Final answer, I don't know. I think that's really valid. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, th I mean, not that, not that you don't know much more than I on the subject, but that's what I've heard from other folks as well uh, <laughs> with that topic. I mean, I think we're going to eventually, like, find strains that are, I mean, I know there are strains that are, more pest resistant than others it seems to be the higher thc strains are less resistant so it and it makes it makes sense biologically that um you know you only have so much energy to spend right so if you're spending energy making phytochemicals you're going to spend less energy fighting off pests you can only do so much. You've only got so many things in the basket. If you're if you're doing if you're only concentrating on one thing, you're missing other things. So lower THC strains have a higher uh, ability to fight off things as they come in. They're not totally resistant, but they are more resistant than the higher THC strains. At least that's in my experience, and you know, as I've asked people, that seems to be the case. I breed a lot of strains and uh, I have high TH strains that are resistant. I could put a particular plant I have in, in a tent that's completely filled with thrip covered plants and that the leaves will stay as green and as perfect as I I any plant you've ever seen. You'll never see a thrip touch it. And I don't think the plant has to work to get rid of the thrips. I just think it's like a have you ever met this guy at the party when they walk in the door? You go, oh, man, I hope he doesn't come over here. And they come over here and they're always talking to you. And it's just like, oh, no. Well, I think this plant is kind of like that. The thrips go, no, hell no, I'm not going there. 
they go somewhere else. So I do have plants that are pest resistant and powdery mildew resistant that are high THC, but I breed specifically trying to get that. And I think that any plant, regardless if it's frosted fruitcake or whatever it is, and it seems like the thrips just eat it for breakfast, I can breed it to stuff and eventually find a, a phenotype that that there it, it is resistant to, let's say, powdery mildew or more resistant to pests. And that may not be, that might be also, because I've seen the same strain, like, because we grow in a, in, a, in a facility where we have many plants growing next to each other, and we have one, it's all the same strain, one plant that gets infested. Like, they're all supposed to be the same, but there's one plant, and maybe, I don't know, like... Yeah, individuals, right? There can be a variation, right? Yeah. And we don't know what that that X factor is. Like, I don't is think that you'll thing? find that fluctuation if you're going from, from clone only. It, uh, the, the ones I have, when it's I get... It's almost clonal variation. Yeah, yeah, maybe it, maybe it would, but I found that the ones that are resistant are pretty well resistant. Uh, but I do occasionally grow a bunch of out, like I'll grow 150 out of one particular cultivar looking for a particular phenotype. And I will get one that, that might have bud rot out of, uh, you know, 150 that never get bud rot. I mean, a lot of trials that I'm familiar with are like in the hundreds of thousands or millions. I don't know if we've really gotten to that point with cannabis. Maybe that's not necessary. I'm not the geneticist in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, before what is the one that takes takes it for the team? Maybe I don't know. Hey, that's actually a legit strategy in some ecosystems. For sure. Like, yes, yes. Thank you, Matthew. Before we go on too late, I just want to say thank you to Matthew and Claude for coming and going. We, we've we actually about 12 minutes over our usual scheduled time. Um, we appreciate each and every one of you coming in to listen. Next week's actually my birthday on Tuesday. So I'm like trying to figure out what I'm going to do for a show because I actually haven't scheduled anything yet. I've got, I may mean, like we're booked till December, but I haven't booked my birthday and figured out what to put on there yet. So I'm debating. If anybody's got some ideas, throw it out here. I'm also debating on starting a new show. It's probably going to be called I Smoke the Best Mids. But uh, we're still working on yes. it. we got a name in progress. We're, we're, we're working on the name in progress. Um, it, don't forget to check us out every Tuesday. Check, check out tomorrow on Channel 1 Future Cannabis Project, um, where I'm going to be live touring runs. Uh, beautiful garden and, and, and space and checking through his library of photos and awesome stuff. So we're going to dig into that. Um, don't miss out on any of the good, good, good or the cool content that's happening on Future Cannabis Project. Follow the people in the group. Check out their links in the description. Say hello. Stay by. You know, comment or anything. If you think my idea for a name is terrible, let me know. I'm probably going to use it anyways. It, it's, it's kind of funny. But regardless... Um, I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. Happy growing, and we will see you next week on the Dank Hour. Ending room. Goodbye.